and I will share the link on your page, the church page, the PBMEBA page, Dr. Leggett, for you, okay? All right. And there we are. We are live. Let her rip. All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to uh, the uh, Progressive uh, Baptist Missionary Educational District Association. Uh, we are participating in part two of our annual uh, October fellowship. And uh, we are again with the uh, distinguished Dr. Jeffrey Curtis, uh, Discipleship Director at the Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Fairfield, California, under the leadership of Dr. Claiborne Lee. And we had a wonderful session last week. And so we are beginning to uh, take part in part two today. And so without further ado, we'll have a prayer. Uh, Pastor Rodney Leg, will you uh, pray for us this morning? And after the prayer, uh, we'll be in the hands of Dr. Curtis. God, our Father, we thank you for just another day. A day that we have the opportunity, God, to just continue to serve you. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to learn more about you, that we could go forward and that we can witness where we live, work, and, and worship, God, that we can help people to come to know you in the pardon of their sins and help those who already know you get closer to you. So bless our facilitator, bless our listening ears, and give us um, understanding and let us comprehend and be able to um, apply to our lives those things that we learn. And so we pray for um, each one of us in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, on this blessed Saturday morning, and I'm honored to uh, be a part and having been asked to facilitate uh, our time here on last week and uh, even this week. And um, before we jump into uh, where we're gonna go, we're gonna do just a quick 30 second at, at the most brief review. Uh, and then we're gonna look at where we're going today. I believe we'll make it uh, through the material that I've planned for us today. Um, but just uh, looking back over last week, if you were with us, uh, are there any pressing questions that you may have uh, that didn't get answered last week? Insights that you gained that you've applied? I had one question. Yes. Uh, in looking at the diagram that you gave us on uh, the disciples' role, um, when I, when I looked at it, it looked like probably the most challenging um, step would be going from uh, the spiritual babe to the spiritual dis discipline. Um, it seems like that's kind of the major jump. It seems like once they get to spiritual discipline, they've made the decision and committed, and then the path is a little smoother. Is that would it be yeah, I would, I, would, I would say, yeah. I, and, and, and I, I think that transition really shows whether the seed has taken root or not. So I, I would agree, you know, sometimes seed falls on rocky ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we can communicate the gospel, uh, all that Jesus has done for us, all that God has provided for us through grace and faith in Jesus Christ. But when we see that transition, I would agree with you. Uh, seed has taken root. Mm -hmm. You just have to continue to allow God to use us as disciple makers to nurture, to nurture those seedlings. So good insight. And hopefully it was a, a simple enough process that uh, you're confident that, that you could walk someone through that process. Um, you know, and I, I challenged uh, all of our people that, that we work with at Mount Calvary 
uh, everyone should pray that God open a, a window of opportunity for somebody to walk into their life where they can have those opportunities to share uh, his story as well as their story, mm -hmm. what God has done for you uh, and how coming to Christ doesn't make your life perfect. Yeah. But it's sure, sure enough a whole lot easier <laughs> with God on your side. So good insight. All right. Well, hopefully I can share my screen and uh, hopefully you can't hear my dog barking outside. And move this. All right. All right, everybody can see my screen? Yes. yes. All right, very good. So our, our jumping off point this morning, uh, we're gonna focus our attention on transformational groups and try to answer the question why groups matter. Um, on last week, we began by looking at the Great Commission. We're talking about transformational discipleship during a pandemic and post-pandemic uh, or post-quarantine era. And uh, as Dr. Leggett has mentioned, uh, so often many churches have decided, hey, we're just gonna put aside our normal discipleship process until we can come up out of this uh, pandemic and we can go back into a, a what's normal. And uh, I believe that we, we're not gonna go back to the same old normal, but we're gonna have a new kind of normal. And so because of the divine command of Jesus Christ for us to make disciples, we can't give up on the great commission, the commission to make disciples. So we focused our attention at the beginning on uh, Matthew, uh, and that should say chapter 28, not 18, uh, 28 verses 16 through 20. And um, then we moved on to talk about transformational discipleship and what does an individual look like who is being transformed. And we focused our attention on uh, a person in the position of weakness, that posture, we talked about truth, which is God's word applied to that person's life through a godly leader. And then finally we wrapped up with what we call the master builder. And again, that's nothing new with me. Uh, that's been around for many, many years, but it is still very relevant for us today. Today's session, again, we're gonna talk about why groups matter. We're gonna take a quick look at online discipleship with Zoom uh, and focus on Zoom etiquette. I'm gonna recommend some materials for you uh, that I've been reading through over the last couple of weeks that I think are ideal for us to, uh, to read and apply as we use a platform like Zoom to disciple people. Uh, we're gonna look at a resource that I use and they continue to enhance it um, since the, uh, our, our shelter in place our social distancing is taking place, and that is Right Now Media, which is an online resource that we use. When I first got to Mount Calvary about five and a half years ago, uh, I persuaded the church to purchase this resource. So I'm gonna actually gonna show you that resource and how it works and how you can use it uh, in your church. And then we'll kind of wrap up with two more things, practical how-tos for setting up your virtual discipleship ministry in your church. And then finally, six needs to anticipate when your church begins to meet again. So let's jump into transformational groups, why groups matter. And again, I want you to have something in your hand to write with, some paper, 
Uh, I'm going to be prompting you from time to time to jot down questions you may ask as we walk through this. Groups are one of God's primary ways of discipling people, of growing people. Too often, there are those Christians who come to faith in Christ, but think that they don't need other Christians in order to help them grow. They think they can watch a video, listen to a CD, watch some things on television, all by their lonesome, and that they will be just fine. But the Bible doesn't teach us that that is the proper way to go. Move this so I can see. This quote comes from a book titled Faithful Over a Few Things. Uh, Green Forest Baptist Church is in the greater Atlanta area, and this book called Fulfillment Hour was written by the late Dr. George McCaleb. And this is a quote from his book. It says, worship also is not and cannot produce effective discipleship. Disciples, not church members, is what God has called us to become. The best pulpit teaching ministry will fall short in fulfilling the command of the Great Commission if it is not supported and or supplemented with some small group interaction. And that's a powerful statement that it takes more, it, it does take the large group preaching ministry, but it also has to be complemented by and supported by some small group interaction. This comes from uh, the former president of Lifeway, a book he wrote several years ago um, titled Essential Church. Um, and this is what, what he writes. And I want you to, to jot down your response. I'm going to ask you a question as I read this, and we'll come back to it when we finish this section. It says, percentage of new Christians who remain active in the church five years after joining. All right. So you see that uh, blue line with 83%, those active in Sunday school. So 83% of individuals who are involved in some kind of small group interaction, whether it's called Sunday school, care groups, fulfillment hour, whatever its functional equivalent is, 83% remain active after five years if they're in a group as opposed to was active in worship services only, 16%, 16%. So when we come back at the end, the question I'm gonna have for you is why do you think this is so? Why do you think this is so? And I'll give you a second or so to, to write down your response. get my screen back the way I want it, okay. Colossians chapter one, verses 28 and 29 from the NIV reads, he is the one who we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ, all the energy uh, Christ so powerfully works in me. So Paul says he's working diligently to help everyone become fully mature in Christ. And you know, the Apostle Paul also told us follow me as I follow Christ, and that he is a good example for us to follow. From association to participation, you see an airplane there on the screen. We fly on an airplane 
And when we fly on an airplane, we associate with the people around us. We're on the same flight. We experience the same bumps, the same views, the same food. We arrive at the same gate at the same time, peruse the same magazines in the seat pocket in front of us. We listen to the same announcements and are greeted by the same flight attendants. But despite having the same experiences and being next to one another, we typically we are not typically in community with those around us. We associate, but we don't participate. And sadly, many churches are like an airplane, filled with people who associate, but don't participate. We can hear the same announcements, sing the same songs, read the same text, and arrive and leave at the same time without participating. The New Testament paints a very different picture. When God started the early church, the people participated together. They did not merely associate. Acts chapter two, verse 42, again from the NIV. Luke writes, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, and I highlighted and underlined that, to the breaking of bread and to prayers, and to prayers. These believers did not merely show up for church, they lived as church. They participated in each other's spiritual growth. Participation with one another is much deeper than merely associating with one another. Look at this scripture, Philippians 1, 3 through 6, again from the NIV. Paul writes these words. I thank my God for every remembrance of you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership. And again, I underlined and highlighted partnership for this reason. It's the exact same Greek word as we read in Acts uh, in the previous passage in Acts chapter one, fellowship or partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And get this now, Paul says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. One of the reasons that Paul was so confident that the Lord would continue to mature his people was because of the partnership, the fellowship, the community enjoyed by believers. God, and this is throughout the New Testament, God uses community to mature his people. And not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. Let me say that again, he uses community, he uses gatherings, he uses small group interaction as a tool for maturing us. Hebrews 3.13 says, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness, by sin's deceitfulness. Community is another Community with other believers keeps our hearts tender and soft before the Lord. God uses community grounded in the gospel to mature us and to shepherd us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, let him who is not in community be aware of being alone into the community you were called. The call was not meant for you alone. In the community of the called, you bear your cross 
you struggle and you pray. Brad House in his book titled Community, Breathing Life into Your Small Groups, he writes this, community is an instrument of worship and a weapon against sin and a tool for evangelism, all for the exaltation of Jesus. So God uses community in the Old Testament. He uses community in the New Testament. He challenges us to be in partnership, fellowship with one another, with the Bible as a central focal point. Not only to, again, like I said last week, not just to fill our head with knowledge, but to help us make application. And I need you and you need me so that we can hold one another accountable to live out the gospel and not just know things about the gospel. I wanna go over a couple slides here and I think I may, I may pause after I do this before we, we get back into this section to get some of your feedback. I want you to see uh, a few slides. Um, this is a cover of a book that was it's titled Transformational Groups, Creating a New Scorecard uh, for Groups. And this was done through Lifeway Christian Resources uh, Research Department. It was a massive study. And uh, I think I may have some numbers uh, for the size of the study. But what, it, what we found was, and I was working at Lifeway at this time, what we found was that people in groups slash class read the Bible more they read the Bible and prayed more. They confessed sins more frequently, shared the gospel more freely, mm -hmm. lived more generously, and served more often than those not in groups. Sounds like some good stuff, doesn't it? If they read the Bible and pray more, confess sins more frequently, share the gospel more freely, give more generously, and serve more often than those that are not in groups. Transformational platforms. Lifeway Research surveyed 2,930 American adults who attend Protestant church at least once a month. Uh, in an effort to better understand the effective, understand effective disciple making. So almost 3,000 adults were a part of the study. Uh, the research is compelling that God is using groups to bring about transformation mm -hmm. in the lives of people. We looked at this uh, little list last week when we looked at transformational discipleship, and we see Bible engagement, obeying God and denying self, serving God and others, sharing Christ, exercising faith, seeking God, building relationships, and transparency, living life unashamed. So when I say groups, I'm referring to a regular small gathering of believers that meet together to encourage one another toward growth and godliness. Regular small group gathering of believers that meet together to encourage one another toward growth and godliness. Again, this is something we can't abandon even in the season of COVID. Let me give you a chance. I need to move my images here so I can see. All right. This list gives us percentages of people who never attend versus individuals who attend at least four times a month. 
So I'm gonna read these off for you so if you can just soak in and then we'll stop after we go through, I think I got three charts like this uh, for us to talk about and get your feedback on. Uh, the first one, here's the question that was asked in the survey. I intentionally make time in my schedule to fellowship and interact with other believers. Those that never attend, 34% said, yeah. Those that attend at least four times a month, 77%, big difference. I intentionally spend time with other believers in order to help them grow in their faith. Those that never attend, 22% versus 63% for those who attend a group at least four times a month. I have developed significant relationships with people at my church. Never attend 57% versus 89% for those who attend a group. I am intentionally putting my spiritual gifts to use, ser to use serving others and God. Those that never attend a group, 42% versus 73% that attend a group at least four times a month, 73%. So you see some stark differences in these groups, in these, in these categories. Here's the second, second one. Uh, I intentionally try to get to know new people in uh, new people in, I get meeting in my church, I should say. 37% um, versus 67%. Throughout the day, I find myself thinking about biblical truths, never attend 45% versus almost 75% that attend a group. If a person is sincerely seeking God, he or she can obtain eternal life through religions other than Christianity. So those that never attend, 71% said, sure, you can get to heaven kind of anyway. Now, even 46% seems a little bit high to me <laughs> for those who attend groups. So we still had to work on that, on that category. Um, spiritual matters, do not tend to come up as a normal part of my daily conversation with other Christians. Does not tend to come up. 65% say, yeah, it never really comes up versus 37% for those who attend at least four times a month. Here's the last one. And it deals with spiritual disciplines. We talked a little bit about spiritual disciplines on last week. And so you can see each of these never attend versus attend at least four times a month. So Bible reading, prayer for my church and my church leaders, study the Bible, prayer in a group with other Christians, pray in a group with other Christians, Pray for fellow Christians I know. Pray for the spiritual status of people I know who are not professing Christians. Confess my sins and wrongdoings to God and ask for forgiveness. So I know that was a lot. Um, and again, you can, this book is in print, so you can purchase this book, Transformational Groups by uh, Ed Stetzer and Eric Geiger. Comments, questions, let me stop there for a minute and give us a quick brain break. Surprising, not surprising, thoughts, 
Well, I did have a question, and I think you kind of answered it when you talked about um, the specifics of other believers gathering in small groups. Um, the question that I had is, um, I, before the pandemic, the part of a um, two groups. One was a Christian Christian based recovery um, group called Celebrate Recovery. Mm -hmm. um, the other one was a community uh, mental health support group. And so, you know, a lot of times um, when we had our meetings, we had, um, for instance, with the Christian recovery group, because it's, you know, Bible believing Christian based, uh, we did have people who would come and attend the meetings that were not believers. But we also uh, took it as an opportunity to be able to evangelize and like you say give our testimonies on you know how God has you know God brought us out of our, um, you know how he's worked in our recovery and he's brought us out of our addictions and things of that sort so I was the question that I had was are you still able to use those small groups as a mean of uh, making disciples uh, for those who are newly in their faith and those who are further along in their faith and, e and using it as an evangelistical tool for those who may not have a relationship with Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and just because we're in a pandemic doesn't mean you need to, you, sh you can't do those groups. One of the things that uh, I say over and over again to our teachers, uh, particularly in our Sunday school classes, uh, I, I tell them, you have to help people. We, we have an intentional strategy for including non-believers in our Sunday school. And I say, you have to help people belong before they believe. Absolutely. If they have a sense of belonging, they'll stay. And God will do what God can do through through you all. Somebody was going to say something. Uh, Dr. Curtis, I, I was looking all the charts that you uh, had on display here for us, uh, I think speaks to this whole notion, or I won't even call it a notion, but uh, there's been a shift. And I don't know when it happened. Maybe Maybe you do. Um, that the emphasis has been more on attending church worship, you know, yeah. and and not getting involved uh, per se in a small group. And the results of that is what you see in these charts in terms of um, the lack of Bible reading. I mean, everything that you hit in the charts is an indication that we have we have shifted from, you know, uh, get in small groups and even Sunday school, if you want to call it that, to just showing up for the church worship experience and then go back home. And that is, this is the result of that moving that shift. I don't know when it happened, uh, but it has happened in a lot of churches. You know, we try to, I try to encourage our church all the time. You know, you've got to get involved in some type of small group. You know, you just cannot attend Sunday morning worship and expect to grow and expect to uh, develop the spiritual disciplines that are needed for you daily to grow spiritually. And so I just see that this shift is, you know, is major, you know, yeah. so we got a lot of folk in church, uh, but we don't have people that are growing because they're just coming to the worship experience and they go back home, and as a result, this is what we get. Yeah, that's that associating but not participating. Yeah, somebody else. Dr. Curtis, one of the things I thought about when you asked why groups don't, don't uh, succeed is one of the things I've seen, this is for me personally, is that Oftentimes people get in, the group leaders get in, and the glory is all about them rather than about God. And so they don't follow the vision that the pastor has. And I think that's a big struggle with a lot of groups, small groups, is people want their glory rather than giving God glory. 
Right, right. And being a servant, there to serve the people, not not to get your praise. So that's that's true. All right, I'm going to um, let me see. Yeah, I wanted to make sure we said this. Um, while the research cannot say that attending groups is the sole cause for the difference, um, that differences that we see, one thing that is definitely clear, those who attend groups act and think differently from those who don't. Um, one of the things that the authors, uh, one of the points they make in this section of the book, Transformational Groups, is this, that we can never forget that we are dependent on the Holy Spirit. And so we need to do what we, we do, use our gifts, serve uh, with a servant's heart. Um, particularly some types of groups uh, require people that really have that pastoral shepherding gift um, as opposed to other types of groups. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but um, it, it, something happens when people are together in groups and prayer is saturated with prayer and God uses that to change people for the better. So uh, we need to know the purpose of our groups. Um, and this has been something that I focused on quite a bit when I was a church consultant, helping people to understand these two basic categories of groups open groups and closed groups, open groups and closed groups. Now, somebody has a question? Okay. Um, I'm a stickler for Sunday morning is prime time, whether you're meeting face to face or even virtually. And so, I'm a stickler for always having the majority of my groups to be open groups because the likelihood of some new person coming is far greater on a Sunday morning than on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, so the open group, the open group concept is key is a key distinction in Sunday school type groups compared to other groups. Actually, I mean, another uh, critical, Im critically important distinction is that Sunday school classes are ongoing. They are ongoing. Because of its ongoing nature, the class can take a systematic approach to the study of his word. That is where curriculum materials come in. Such materials are almost as old as the movement itself. They're not intended as a substitute for the Bible, but rather as a plan to study it, learn it, teach it, all of it over the course of a lifetime at a, at a level appropriate for the age and stage of each learner. So the traditional good Sunday school material is always going to be foundational. It's always going to be evangelistic. It's always going to challenge for growth and application. And um, as, opposed to, as opposed to a closed group, sometimes we call D groups or discipleship groups, which is classified more as advanced training regardless of its purpose, is best accomplished in a discipleship group, which is, closed, which is a closed group, usually for a short-term course of study that is more intense in nature than an open group like Sunday school. All right. And I think somebody may not be on mute. So if you're not on mute right now, uh, select mute. Um, let me give you an example of a 
closed group, discipleship group. We do a we do a several discipleship classes, one of which is called Discovering Your Spiritual Gifts. It is a eight to 10 week class where the students do assessments. They learn what the Bible says spiritual gifts are. They, they uh, look at a list of various spiritual gifts articulated in the New and Old Testament. Uh, they take assessments. Uh, it is closed because if you have missed the first two weeks, you can't catch up with where everyone else is. And so typically after the first two weeks, if you haven't enrolled in that class and started, then you can't get into it. So it's closed. Same thing, we do another class called Lifestyle Stewardship. We do another class called Becoming a Contagious Christian, which is how to share your faith. Again, all of those classes, they start and stop. We do them every quarter. But if you've missed the first couple, it's impossible to get in and be where you need to be with the other group, uh, as opposed to a Sunday school class or a traditional Sunday school type class, which is open because you can jump in at any time. All right. So that gives you kind of a difference. So you got to know the purpose of your groups. Um, and if you want to reach people, you want to grow your church through your groups, you want to have as many open groups as you can as opposed to the types of groups where you have to say you can't you, you can't come until next month because we're already way down the road. Uh, Doc, could you elaborate a little bit on the open group uh, in regards to, for example, um, you know, you're doing a week to week study uh, and someone who may not be familiar with your small group or Sunday school class uh, should be able to pick up the lesson mm -hmm. uh, for that particular day, even though they have not participated in previous lessons. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It's, and that makes perfect sense. So they should, a good open group and a good teacher uh, teaches in such a way that if they weren't there for the last five weeks, they can still jump in. Uh, and again, if there is an intentional mix of saved and lost, a good teacher teaches in a way that they don't assume people know biblical terms, biblical terminology. Um, and so you know how sometimes we can say, oh, you know, we know how these Sadducees and Pharisees are. Well, if I've never read the Bible and I've never even heard of that. And so that wouldn't be a good statement to make. So um, again, it's foundational. A good open group is foundational. It doesn't mean it's shallow. It doesn't mean it's shallow, but it's foundational. And uh, as we move down the course of our time this morning, I'm gonna show you an example of what we use. Uh, it's ongoing. It doesn't start and stop. Again, our discipleship classes go, we start in winter. We do spring, we take the summer off for discipleship classes, and then we do fall. Um, now we still do our midweek Bible study. Uh, Dr. Lee, for the most part, leads that right now. And that's every Tuesday, and it's, it's uh, at noon and it's seven. That's a larger group. Uh, it's on Facebook Live. Um, not on Zoom, so there's no real interaction other than what people type in the chat and he can't see the chat. Um, so it's very different than what we're talking about as it relates to small group interaction. Uh, another good characteristic of open groups is that it's evangelistic, should always challenge people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Some have said you always need to have an empty chair in your Sunday school class. And the empty chair is for the one that everyone in the class is praying for. Can you imagine if a class of 15, 20 people, how many unchurched, unsaved people, 20 people know at work, at school, at home, in their family. And if we have what I call the top 10 most wanted list, everybody should have a top 10 most wanted list. 
people that, that you're praying for, you're sick in the Holy Spirit of, and you're praying for them, that God would touch their heart and open the door of opportunity for the gospel to seep into their life. That empty chair is for them. And so we always need to be thinking about growth in our groups. The Bible needs to be central. The Bible needs to be central. Now, there are all kinds of things that can be studied, but the Bible needs to be at the heart of it. And we'll hit this again. Intentional mix of lost and saved, I mentioned that, and we need to always be looking toward multiplication, multiplication. Um, and this is always a challenge. I found it to be a challenge for years and years and years. Um, you have some classes that begin to grow and you see, I walk around, I see 50 ladies in one class and I think that's not good. That's not a good thing because <laughs> that now is no longer small group interaction. And the larger the group gets, the fewer people are comfortable talking and sharing and opening up. Um, one of the things that we're doing now with our, our groups that we'll look at online, um, if I see a consistent attendance of 30 people, we multiply the class. And so we're blessed to have more than one teacher in each class. Some classes we have four and five teachers. So we're able to expand and make sure that it remains small group interaction as opposed to becoming a, a, another church inside the church where again, you have a superstar teacher um, and basically the people just listen and they don't get to interact with one another. One of the things you need to do, and I mentioned some of this last week is lead. Lead, the research shows that people don't believe groups are really that important to leaders. And here's what, it share, here's what the research shows. Groups should be important to churches because God has supernaturally ordained community to sanctify his people. God, who is an eternal community of three persons, created community for our benefit and his glory. And small groups help believers to live in community with one another. Though most pastors say that groups are important, the research revealed that for many churches, there is a major discrepancy between the stated importance of groups and the actual lack of importance. For many churches, contrary to what is articulated, Groups are really not that important. At least a two alarming facts were discovered. Number one, the majority of church attendees don't believe that groups are important. Um, though the pastor says that groups are important, the church, sadly, the church, sadly, the majority of church attendees don't say the same thing. In other words, Groups being important is an aspirational value for church leaders in many churches, but it is not actual in the culture of the church. Church leaders should ask themselves why the people in the church don't consider groups more important. The following question should be asked to, uh, and help, can be helpful to consider. And here are a couple bullets. Uh, are the pastors and leaders are in groups? Are the pastors and leaders in groups? Are the deacons in groups? Are they teaching groups? Um, do the people in the church continually hear about groups? If someone wanted to join a group today, what would you tell that person to do? Are stories of transformation occurring in the community shared with the church. And in comparison to the weekend services, how much energy is poured into the group strategy, leader training, etc. The reality is that most church leaders devote much more energy to the worship service than groups. 
caring less about worship gatherings is not the solution, but caring more about groups is. In worship gatherings there uh, that are grounded in Jesus, God supernaturally uses the preaching of his word and the worship to transform hearts and affections. And in groups grounded in Jesus, God supernaturally uses community to mature as people. Both are important, but must be important. Both must be important to your church. All right. And then the second one, and, and it's, it's very similar, is for many churches, group content is treated haphazardly. Uh, the research shows that two thirds of pastors had no idea what the curriculum was that was being taught in their groups. So that's, that's pretty staggering. Let me stop there, give us a time to process comments, thoughts, insights. It, it used to be said uh, that, uh, I'm kind of going back to my other point again, but it used to be said that the Sunday school uh, well, there there are several there are several ways that one can come into the church, but um, you know I came to church through Sunday school. Mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't through the morning worship that you know I, I got saved. It was through my Sunday school class, you know. And um, uh, just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Uh, if you had some, if you could share. Or I'm, I, I'm, I'm like you, I came to faith through Sunday school. You know, as, as a 12 year old. And it was just, it was more pertinent. It was more relevant. It was more personal because I love my teachers. They love me. And, you know, as a fifth, sixth grader, um, that was where I really, gained an understanding and the Holy Spirit um, got hold to me. And so that was the same, it was the same for me. When you look at, there's a, uh, there's a little pamphlet, I think it may be free if you go on lifeway.com. Um, uh, it's a book, maybe 30 pages called Missionary Sunday School, Missionary Sunday School. And, uh, it paints the history of the Sunday school movement in America and how as the, the, the continent began to develop, uh, the country began to grow from east to west, um, that there weren't enough pastors, of course, especially on the frontier, as you got out into Ohio and Indiana and moving further west. So they had circuit preachers who would make the rounds to the churches, sometimes once a month, sometimes twice a month. Um, so they did not have worship service every week. They may only had worship service because the preacher was only there once a month. But one thing they did have every week, every Sunday was Sunday school, was Sunday school. So even as the nation developed and began to mature from east to west. And there were more full-time pastors that were able to serve in the Midwest and the West. Even back then, sometimes people would come to Sunday school and leave as opposed to going to the worship service because the Sunday school was the thing that grounded them and helped them to be able to grow. And so, like you said, Pastor uh, Dr. Leggett, um, we've seen to have flipped the script, <laughs> if you will, and have removed one of the essential things that have helped people grow spiritually. And one of the things the Bible says that we need, and that is those that small group interaction with a godly leader and other people around us to hold us accountable to be what God has called us to be. So good. Someone else? Dr. Curtis, what, yes. 
what about that whole process? Um, Cause in my current position, I'm, I'm leading um, singles over, over 30. And um, so we meet on Thursday night and there's a group teaching time, worship teaching, and then they break off into small groups. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do since, since coming into this position is I just been focusing on belonging. And, and my goal is to move from belonging to um, becoming, that's the aspect of discipleship, and then believing. Because I, 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 I was trying to find the material, but it says, says that, you know, people have a hard time uh, reconnecting with people outside of the church when they kind of scale our walls to get in and, um, and, and they lose that contact with people who, you know, like you said, the, the, the empty chair. But I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this be, uh, belonging uh, will then lead to um, greater relationships that become discipleship driven. So, yeah, I like that. So belonging, becoming, and believing. Right. Yeah. I like it. And and I and I just I'll just add this. There, there's a video out about the growth of the church in. Um, Iran entitled um, uh, Wolves Among Sheep. And, mm -hmm. and, and what the members of the church in Iran are saying is, is that in the West, um, uh, we, uh, I think they, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to get this right. We disciple to convert. In Iran, they convert to disciple. Hmm. Say that again. I think I think I mixed that up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think they said that. Uh, so o, o, over in over in Iran, this is it. Over in Iran, they disciple to convert, but they said in 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 the West, we convert to disciple. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that certainly for the West. All right, good conversation. Three actions, three actions you must take. First, develop your leaders, develop your leaders. Leaders produce who they are. All right, here, and he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man. Mature man, let me see, I can't see that. With a stature measured by Christ. So he personally gave, this matters deeply. It tells us it matters deeply to God. He gave pastors to train people for ministry, not to do ministry. And when this happens, the body grows into a mature man. And pastors train the saints because the effect is we all grow. So training leaders is essential. Um, there are all kinds of ways training can happen. Um, we had in our staff meeting Wednesday, uh, Again, Dr. Lee pushes us to always think about how can we do what we did on the ground in the air. One of the things that I presented uh, is that we are now shifting our monthly uh, training uh, into the air. 
into uh, online format. And so we're working now on developing that so that we can continue to equip our teachers to be more effective even in this new environment. So training is critical. So we're doing that. There are other resources out there, quite a few that you can use to equip your people. So develop your leaders, develop new leaders. Um, there's a church in Texas. Some of you heard of uh, Concord Church. Brian Carter's there. Uh, they're doing an outstanding job on uh, providing discipleship online via Zoom. And every weekend, they train new leaders. Every weekend. Uh, when I first saw it, I was so intrigued by it, and this was months ago, uh, I signed up for the training and uh, got on one Saturday and um, can't think of her name right now, but, but the pastor's wife, first lady, uh, leads the training. And, um, and so one of the, the leaders there asked, she said, uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, Curtis, we, we can't find your paperwork where well, you're a member. And I said, I'm not a member. I just wanted to see what y'all were doing. And so they said they were honored that I was there. So we, I was able to participate uh, in their training. So they're constantly equipping uh, new people to lead groups and how to use Zoom and so forth. The second thing of the three is launch new groups. Launch new groups. There is power in the new. Uh, in a local church, there is power in the new. Though we wish that weren't true sometimes, uh, it's definitely, there's power in it. Uh, new believers share their faith. When we reach new people, new believers share their faith more than seasoned believers than seasoned believers. And that's one of the things uh, Dr. Morgan was just mentioning, how people, when they've been around for a while, they, they stop doing and lose some of the excitement that they had um, when they first came to faith in Jesus Christ. New groups uh, connect more people connect with more people than existing groups. One of the things we know that even new worship services grow faster than existing worship services and new churches grow faster even than older churches. Without new groups, you will not be uh, giving new people who come into your church a place to connect or grow in community with other believers. Imagine a new per a person in your church as a Lego. He is looking for a place to connect. In existing groups, there are fewer opportunities for connection. Some ways to connect are available, but a new group makes it much easier to do. It is similar to moving into a new neighborhood. If you have uh, ever done so, you know that everyone connects, everyone compares, shutters, and gutters. People gather for cookouts. Contrast that into moving into an existing neighborhood. The experience is very different. New people connect more easily in a new environment. I want to give us some best practices for starting new groups, whether it's on the ground or in the air. Starting new group, groups requires a catalyst. It requires a catalyst. Are you that catalyst? You must have the vision for reaching new people and be willing to do the hard work it takes to make it happen. So here are some simple steps. And I'll kind of walk through these kind of slow. Number one, of course, is prayer. Prayer. Pray for God to lead you to who you need to reach, assimilate, and disciple. Pray for God to call others to help you 
start a new group. Prayer. Number two, identify your target. Decide what will the makeup of your new group be? Is it young adults? Is it youth? Is it uh, young families? Is it seniors? Who is not yet being reached? Remember I said your greatest mission field is right inside the walls of your own church. So who is not in the group? We already see most people aren't engaged in some kind of small group interaction. So what's the target? Select resources, Bible studies that your group will use. Use resources that address both needs of the people that you're trying to reach and your the abilities of your leaders. The fourth thing is develop a list of people who need to consider the new group. Develop a list with contact information of potential members for your new group. Choose a date to start your new group. And of course, it can start at any time. <clears throat> Choose a time and location where your group will meet. And right now, for the most part in California, for the most part, we are meeting in the air, even though we can, we can gather in smaller groups, just have to find the right place, maybe a park, someone's backyard. Enlist and equip your small group leaders. A couple of weeks ago, you know, since we're in this season, I go to church about five times on Sunday. Uh, I get up early and watch different different services, including our own. And um, last month, September, which is the beginning of the school year, um, a church in Texas, uh, and a good friend of mine, did a commissioning service. Um, the only one that was there was the Sunday school superintendent but did a commissioning service for the Sunday school teachers. And so, and he prayed as a pastor, he prayed publicly uh, for the workers and commissioned them to, to fulfill the purpose that God has placed on their life as Sunday school teachers. So pray publicly and privately, make a list of prospective officers and teachers and secure the consent of those who have been selected to serve. We're about 100% of the workers will be found right in your church. Sometimes we, people say, well, if, if they're asked, how come you're not serving? Oftentimes their response will be, nobody has asked me. Pray for the leaders. And this goes with the other thing. Don't say no for somebody else. Well, they're too busy. So I'm not even gonna ask them. No, don't say no for someone else. Let them say no. Enlist with integrity. What do I mean by this? Pray, ask God, God, who do you want to lead this class? and wait and listen for God to speak to you. And when you go to them, you can honestly say, God told me to ask you. And sometimes they may say, well, if I don't do it, who else you gonna get? 
Nobody. I, I mean, I didn't have a plan B. I've been praying about this for a month, two months, and the Lord led me to ask you. So uh, don't say you're the best person for the job when you don't really believe it. Enlist with integrity. And again, the importance of training is critical and there are all kinds of training methodologies and small uncomplicated books to give them to use. The Apprentice, I use this all the time. And my people, uh, our people at Mount Calvary, they love it. Um, I do, so I tell them, start with this. I do, you watch. Always have somebody watching you. I do, you help me. And you do, and I help you. And then you do, and I watch. So there are, since I've been in Mount Calvary, there are certain positions. We, uh, I led the church to put together kind of job slash ministry descriptions for key leaders. And one of the things that we added in those job descriptions are term limits. So no one can officially stay in a position for over six years. So there are three year terms. It can reoccur once and then somebody else has to step in. So I told him, I said, you need to always be training somebody else. Anything can happen to you. It may not be that you termed out, but anything can help happen to you. And the ministry has to continue to go. And we need competent, capable people to be able to lead. So we need competent, capable people who can lead the ushers, who can lead the greeters, who can oversee Sunday school, who can oversee the food pantry, who can oversee the clothes closet, who can be in the parking lot ministry. Who's, who's your number two? Who's watching you? Who's helping you? Um, building leaders. And that's a part of the whole discipleship process. Start with a fellowship. Plan and conduct a fellowship or interest party. Host the first group meeting. And then finally, encourage, evaluate, encourage, and celebrate. I tell you, my time gets away from me quick. Now oh, 11. Uh, enlist and train additional leaders. As the group grows, enlist and train additional small group leaders, especially an apprentice. Encourage the group to pray to start a new group in the next six to 18 months as the groups cease to grow after 24 months. and then begin the process again. Then finally, and I'm gonna be brief here, feed your people, that's the third thing. Feed your people. John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And this goes back to the Bible being the center of what our groups are about. There's lots of stories I can tell you about groups I've attended over the years and they never cracked the Bible open, which was quite disturbing. So feed them the word of God. 
this is the last big point, and then I'm gonna wrap up with a, a illustration. Can't see where we we're at. Seventy-five percent. The the research shows seventy-five percent of leaders report they want direction. And what this is saying, in summary, is three out of four teachers, the, the discipleship directors, Sunday school directors, wanted direction from their senior leaders, their pastors. That they, they felt like they didn't have enough direction. What should we be teaching? When, when should we be doing it? Let me finish with this, and I mentioned, I think I mentioned this in the in the interview, not yet last week. But uh, I love going up into the mountains. Uh, I live here in Fairfield, California. Uh, most of my family is in Fresno County. And uh, when I go down, sometimes uh, we go up into Sequoia National Park and uh, spend time with the big trees. And some of you probably been up there. It's, it's beautiful and it's just an awesome sight to see. This, these were a couple of pictures from the last time I was up there. And um, it's an amazing thing. This tree here, G General Sherman tree is the largest living tree on earth. Um, these trees are massive. They are massive. Um, in the uh, Kings Canyon National Park, there are 95 named groves of trees. 95 named groves. Sequoia trees only grow in groves. They never grow apart from other sequoia trees. They only grow together. They can grow as high as 300 feet and over 40 feet in diameter. It takes them 20 years to mature. And many of the trees in Kings Canyon National Park are well over 3,000 years old. But the unique thing about these trees is their root system. Their roots only go approximately 12 feet deep into the ground. So imagine a tree that weighs tens of thousands of pounds, 300 feet plus high, over 40 feet in diameter, with a root system that only goes down approximately 12, 10 to 12 feet. But another unique thing about their root system is that their roots don't go deep, but they spread out. And the root system of one sequoia tree, like the one I'm standing under here, and this one, General Sherman, can spread out over one acre. And so these trees are gathered together in these groups, in these groves, and they stand the test of time, the wind, snow, fires, earthquakes, and over 3,000 years they stand because the root system is connected with the next tree, which is connected to the next tree, which is connected to the next tree. And I think this is an apt illustration of how God uses groups and how he uses this sense of community for us to connect with one another. And when we're connected, like these giant trees are connected, when life squeezes us, presses against us, we can hold one another up, feeding on the nutrients that is God's word. So if you wanna stand as life keeps pushing on us and especially in this time of, of COVID, it with depression, with anxiety, with financial challenges, with health worries, with governmental issues, with social issues that we encounter in 2020, I challenge you, get connected. 
and challenge others to get connected so that their root systems can be connected together. And together we can stand. You can't stand alone. Amen. Let me stop there. I think I got a couple questions for us and you can ask anything else or give any other input. Uh, what changes can you make to refocus your church on groups? How can your groups be retooled for greater transformation? And what did you learn that you did not know before? Let's take a few minutes and then we'll hit our last couple sections. Anyone? I don't want to just move on without you. So I, I teach the women's Sunday school class at, um, at Providence. And we have probably a solid core group of about 15 women, I guess. Um, and I'm, I'm, 61 and I'm the youngest one in the class. So kind of uh, the challenge has been trying to get some of the younger women. And when I say younger women, not necessarily 30 year olds, but other than our senior women who are in their 70s and 80s to attend the women's class because from a, a Sunday school lesson standpoint, um, it's the only class that's offered for the women. There's another class that's offered for, that the younger women go to, but they tend not to use the Sunday school book. Their class is based upon different books that they read. Um, so any suggestions or any feedback uh, that you can provide? Yeah, and what's what's the size of the uh, the other group? The younger um, group? I think that she probably has maybe about 10, 12 in her, in her class. Okay. Do you think there's enough that would want to start a younger group using the Sunday school material? I don't know. I don't I mm -hmm. They tend to gravitate to reading books. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying that that's wrong or right, but that just seems to be for them where they prefer reading books and discussing the books as opposed to discussing the Sunday school lesson. And yeah. I remember being in um, a meeting with some, with some younger, um, members uh you know for our youth and our young adult and the the the, the word came uh, or the or the statement came it's just recycled lessons and that kind of threw me because for me i can read a scripture today and it'll say one thing to me and then i can read it again next week and it'll say something else to me um but how do you get young people interested in coming to Sunday school? Our younger people, I should say, not young people, younger people. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It, um, first I'll, I'll say with regard to the books, reading a book, uh, and this is a, I, I have a stickler for this. Last week we talked about the Great Commission, and Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Good Sunday School curriculum has a good, what we call a scope and sequence. 
Some is three years, some is six years, some is eight years, but it covers the whole counsel of God. I think we fail in fulfilling the divine command to teaching them to observe all things whatsoever the Lord has commanded us when we, when, when we approach it haphazardly. So just picking a book and saying, hey, I, this is a good book, I think we should read it. Over the course of time, you, you're ultimately gonna fail at teaching people the whole counsel of God, which is why it's better, always better to stick with a curriculum than just this random pulling stuff out of the air. So that would be one thing, you know, if I was at your church and I had some kind of say, uh, that would be one of my main justifications for us using a curriculum rather than taking a random approach. I think in terms of getting people together, it's, it's helpful in, in some cases to have people gathered together who are in similar similar life stage, uh, regardless of their age. So whether it's a Gen Z, which are like 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds, they're gonna feel way more comfortable together than in an old man's class. You know, while they'll still learn, uh, application and illustrations are way different. Um, and so I would say, take a look at take a look at that younger group. Who who in the, in there? Who in the, who's a millennial? Uh, my kids are millennials. They're in their thirties. They came of age two thousand. Um, they prefer to be with one another. And start there. Start slow. Start with prayer. And I think that's the best way to approach it. And watch God open windows of opportunity. They have needs and, and the Bible can fulfill those needs. So I know that's, uh, it's just hard work. That's all I can say. Somebody else may have a, some input. Doc, I think you really hit right on top of it. It is a hard group and they do like to be with themselves um, and you just got to keep I think most of our churches struggle with that at some particular time you know and finding uh, those young teachers you know that that want to be a part of that process and so yeah. uh, it, it's a it's a tough group but it it does require a lot of prayer and um uh, and another issue with young people that I know that there are some that want to lead, um, but we've got to give them some, we've got to give them enough rope uh, to, to use their gifts, you know, and so uh, I know that sometimes as pastors and, and uh, educational leaders and whatnot, um, you know, we we, we might be somewhat apprehensive about allowing them the opportunity to, to, you know, to use their gifts because it's, because it's a little somewhat different at times than yeah. the norms, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, and, and also being open to not just having a group on Sunday morning, you know, we have a, I have a couple of groups that, you know, we do different types, different times of the week uh, that we meet. But if you're trying to do everything on a Sunday morning, uh, that's going to definitely be problematic to your young people. You know, yeah. find a time where they can meet, where they're comfortable. Uh, and it might be a coffee shop, you know. Um, it might be on, it might be on Zoom or some social media platform, but you got to, you know, um, I, I'm finding it's easy to sit down and talk with them and find out what is what are some of their challenges um, and what are some things that that they want to do um, mm -hmm. uh, to be more helpful than trying to create something and then making them come or inviting them to come 
and then, you know, kind of force feeding this stuff on them as opposed yeah. to just really finding a place where they can just belong. Right. You know, like you said, where, you know, finding that place where they can just belong. Yeah. Good. Let it, yeah. Let it organically just kind of come to come, come to be. Yeah. Good, good. All right. I'm sitting here thinking about how, what I, how much I want to cover. Um, this is a, a book I purchased a couple of weeks back. Um, this is a great book, great book. Uh, Online Teaching with Zoom, a guide for teaching and learning with video conferencing platforms. Um, I don't know, I, didn't, I don't even think it was $20. I bought it on Amazon. <clears throat> Not a hard read at all, covers all of the essentials that you need. Uh, to teach with Zoom uh, and to have Zoom meetings. So I wanted to make sure, because I can't, I couldn't, it, it would take a couple of days to teach through uh, all of this, but this is a great resource for you, Aaron Johnson. All right. Um, I'm gonna run through these real quick, okay? And uh, I'm going to provide um, these slides to Pastor Dr. Leggett, and um, if you uh, want them, contact him, and then uh, he can make these available for you, all right? So real quick, we're going to go through these quick because I want to show you some other things and before we wrap up. Um, Video option use, <clears throat> and these are basically some etiquette things. First of all, always test your equipment. We tested my big computer this morning and for some reason my microphone uh, was not working. Uh, I shifted to another computer, but if I didn't have another computer, I could have shifted to a different uh, audio and microphone platform. So the suggestion is always to have multiple means of getting online. Uh, use the video option when possible. Uh, it lets people see you. This is particularly important if you are the one hosting the meeting uh, or speaking. So ideally you, you want to use the video option. Um, appearance, appearance, you see this guy here. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, I have actually even seen on one of our Sunday school classes, somebody in their bed. Um, so dress for the occasion. <laughs> uh, times are tough for those who are working from home, but if you are in a position where you can put on something more professional looking, uh, not too much glitter or bling and sometimes it helps when you uh helps when you feel a little more normal all right setting the stage uh keep in mind that people aren't uh just seeing you they're also seeing whatever uh the camera is pointed at behind you so as much as possible remove clutter personal items uh lift computer so that you are at eye level and I always try to be at eye level. Uh, you watch a lot of Zooms and everybody's looking down and uh, it's always better to be at eye level. Um, keep your device connected to electricity. Uh, this can help improve the quality. Bright lights. Um, and my light that I usually have connected to my monitor broke on me, so I got another backup here. Um, the video quality is important with more, improved with more lighting. Sometimes an extra nearby lamp is usually helpful. Just make sure that the light is in front of you and not behind you, or else you appear to be backlit. Uh, avoid sitting with your back towards the window and re refrain from having a backlight side light because it creates a silhouette. 
again, look into the camera. And that's self-explanatory. I mentioned this, do your own tech support before you start, make sure you run a test. And again, we got on about 15 minutes before and I have to figure out what's going on with my microphone on my big computer. This is another important one. And we struggled with this early on with some of our classes. Stay on mute if you're not talking. Background noise can be easily distracting. Uh, if you aren't sharing anything at the moment, go ahead and mute yourself until you do. I see a lot of this, especially at noon meetings. Uh, I mean, hamburgers and everything. Uh, so hold off and don't eat uh, if you don't have to. Sometimes for longer meetings, you may want to have something to drink. So I have, I have my little Gatorade here, but I have an open. <clears throat> uh, no need to multitask. Beware, others can see and hear what you're doing and saying. And I've seen some Zooms where people have their phone and a lot of meetings going on there. So try to avoid multitasking. And this is, this is similar. When leading a meeting, be careful. I'll be mindful of time. Stay on task and keep unnecessary conversation to a minimum. If you have an agenda, follow it. If necessary, advise people to post questions in the chat if possible. Respond as necessary or advise the team that you are willing to stay later and answer questions. All right, and this is just be careful. Uh, if a meeting is private, make sure it's private. So use passwords. And the host should be the last one to leave. If the host closes the meeting, it's just proper to stick around until everyone else closes out the meeting. All right. Questions, comments on that little brief. Again, if you get that book that I shared, it'll be very helpful for you. All right, for the sake of time, we're gonna shift gears. I want to show you a resource that we use. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. This is a resource called Right Now Media. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, when I got to Mount Calvary, uh, I encouraged them to purchase this. There are right now approximately 16,000 different Bible study type resources on here. Um, we use it, I looked this morning, we have almost 900 active users on our church account. Um, they have everything from, let me show you, They have everything from, and I'm gonna just scroll, uh, original books of the Bible, and these are different Bible studies, popular Bible studies, newly added studies, studies on racism. But Doc, we're, we're not seeing your screen. We're not screen, seeing it, okay. All we see is your PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, what are you seeing now? 
Are we okay. good? Yeah, we're good now. Okay. We're back to the top. Yeah, let me know if you can't see it. All right. So this is Right Now Media. And um, this is our church crest, our logo over there to the left. So these are all the different categories. Newly added studies, studies on racism and reconciliation, studies on responding to crisis, personal devotionals, small group Bible studies, family devotionals, loads of stuff for kids, popular Christian living studies, uh, studies for men. So a lot of our men's Bible studies we can find here. Uh, children. So this works on your main computer, on your tablet, on your phone. If you have a smart TV, you can load Right Now Media's channel and do any Bible study right from your television at home. A new feature that they've added since COVID-19, I'm gonna shift over. This was a men's Bible study that we did, Authentic Manhood 33 series. And so we could assign, I could assign the brothers a video to watch. Again, they can watch it at their convenience or we can watch it all together. Um, the video comes up. And it's a complete session. This is one of about eight sessions. Right here, this is a feature that they've recently added. It says watch in, watch as a virtual group. Watch as a virtual group. So you can click that and as a group at home, you can watch and you can communicate with one another with possibly 16,000 different Bible studies. Uh, again, it, it works on any kind of smart device, phone, iPad, Android. All you have to do is download it, go to the app store. Uh, once your church purchases it, your church does have to purchase it. They don't do independent sales. Uh, once your church purchases it, uh, the price never goes up. So if your church grew to another thousand people, the price would remain the same. So this is a, a it's actually even one of the gifts that we give to visitors to you know, our church. We give them access to these studies. Another one quick thing I wanted to show you, go back to the main. We can add, and your church could add your own channel. So right here, you see it says Mount Calvary Baptist Church. So that is our channel. So we can upload anything we wanna upload. So I uploaded this, this was a presentation I did on part of the book of Revelation. So we can video, you can even video with your phone. Uh, and it can be uploaded to your church channel. We do things like, um, these were our classes I've taught. This was one of our leadership summits. So we recorded the summit for those who weren't able to make it and put it on there. Uh, this is our new members orientation. So we load that and people who I, I don't, I never tell people that it's there uh, because we want them back when we could meet, we wanted them to come physically, uh, but it is available to them. So we could record, this was our sexual harassment training and you can attach documents to this. You can attach, you can create quizzes. Uh, there's just a plethora of things that you can do uh, and it, was just, it would just be a matter of contacting rightnowmedia.com and having them price it for you. They train you. 
they come out to the church and train you uh, to use this. So this is the, another great online tool that churches can use. Doc, Dr. Uh, Kurtz, let me ask you, I mean, I have, I, well, I don't have it. I'm, I'm using Redwoods currently uh, uh -huh. have. And so I'm on here a lot. What I did not, and I'm glad this feature is here, but what I did not see much, I, I did see some, but not enough uh, was culturally sensitive in terms of most of the authors, uh, good authors, by the way, but I just, what I had some challenges with, um, and that's just my own bias, perhaps, I didn't mm -hmm. see a lot of material for African Americans. And so maybe you have a better way of navigating uh, through some of this. Uh, and I do think it's a great resource. I, I just didn't see enough. So I was so glad to see that you all have some content on here. Is that, can other churches access what you all have? They cannot. Okay. Yeah. So the only people that can access Mount Calvary stuff is people that have a Mount Calvary account. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But your point is well taken. You got to know what you're looking for. So I mean, we're out. We're in there. Right. Got to know. Put in a name. See what pops up. So. Other questions on right now media. So I'm gonna go to one more thing. So again, you can use it synchronously. That means your whole group can be on. You can watch it at the same time. There's a study that that we do in our discipleship classes called. This is by Chip Ingram. So um, this is one of our discipleship classes. And. So they, she has them watch, she assigns a session for them to watch. They watch it and then they come together on Sundays and discuss the session. And right here, they can buy the study guide. So they can buy the study guide directly from the page. So they'll have the book in hand. So even when they were meeting face to face, even when they were meeting face to face, they viewed the videos before. And then they spent the hour debriefing and unpacking. Can do you have any thoughts about uh, I, I know that we're all different kind of learners, but what what kind of impact does videos have in terms of, you know, a, a teaching session? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it is a video teaching session, uh, but I think, and one of the things that right now media will tell you is you cannot abdicate your responsibility of, for discipling people to a video. Right. So you haven't watched the video, the teaching session, but you need to come back together. Same thing if it's, if it's your youth, you know, they may watch something on their phone in their free time. And hey, when we meet, we're gonna have some pizza, hot dogs, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And we're gonna talk about the assignment. Yeah. And it's an, it's an amazing thing. When I teach at the seminary, it's always interesting to hear youth pastors say, I cannot get my youth to read the Bible. But if I take a section of the Bible, cut and paste it into a text and send it to them, they read it. <laughs> I mean, this is going nowhere. Uh, and actually with Lifeway Sunday School material for you, you can, you can get it digitally and have it loaded on, on their phone. Because a, uh, a lot of students, they'll, you give them a Sunday School book, they forget it and leave it at home, but they're not forgetting this. Yeah. They had another study Life we had that was focused on African Americans. I don't know if it was it called "Study the Bible for Life" or something like that nature. I don't know if you recall that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
Let me make sure I can share this. This is what we use. This is called, I don't know if you can see it. Are you seeing this? Yeah. It says honor all relationships. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. This is called the U curriculum. YOU curriculum. This is the curriculum that Lifeway does that targets multicultural African American churches. So, this is actually the lesson for Sunday. And I try to send out at least a month's worth of lessons digitally for our teachers. And for everyone on their roster, they send the lesson. So this is the actual student section of the lesson. So they're going through the Ten Commandments, which is uh, within this, this unit. So this is the one on honoring relationships. And you see, so this is the Sunday school lesson that's in the book, except it's digital. So they get this at least a week before, the students get this at least a week before and they do their lesson, they read through their lesson, they fill in blanks, they answer questions, it gives them activities to do. And then they come back on Sundays and the teacher leads them through the lesson. It also has devotionals that correspond with the lesson for that week. So this is a, this is what we, we use. So they actually physically have, they can print this at home, uh, the lesson for each week. So there's no real difference now, even though we, we, we cut the purchase of all of our books for the most part, but we get this at a whole lot cheaper price than we were getting when we were purchasing books. So they got a teacher's, there's a teacher's file I didn't pull that one up. Um, this is the student section. And then there's some tips for them to use in teaching. One last thing, and then we're on your time. Okay. Can you see our church website? Yeah, okay. All right, I'm gonna let this banner scroll. If you wanna join the church, you click on this and it takes you to an email that comes to me. I'm gonna let this scroll across. Think one more. All right, right here. So listed here 
are all of our current weekly small group class offerings. So this is a men and this is a co-ed class. It's a men's class. So it, it lists the teachers. Up here, I included the description for what these classes are about. So it's designed to lead people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and build great commission Christians who become more like Jesus individually, behave more like the body of Christ and corporately and ultimately transform their ministry context. So all of these are classes, even including uh, the children's class for five through 12 year olds. And that meets at 12, 15 on Sundays. So anybody can come in we encourage new members that join to join a Sunday school class and all they need to do is come on and they just click. Uh, and it says the time that they begin and they can go right into the Sunday school class. And once they're, they wanna become a part of the class, they get on a, a roster list and they receive the lessons uh, at least that Monday before the next Sunday for that lesson. So that's kind of how we set it up. We'll be adding some more classes, some discipleship classes to this um, within the next couple of weeks. All right, as we wrap up, I stole two minutes from you. So. <laughs> Questions, comments? Ideas for me. All right, I hear silence. So, Doc, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, Doc, the Kurt, Dr. Curtis, thank you so much for uh, sharing these two past Saturdays with us. This has been very helpful, um, I know, to many. Um, and so we're grateful. I see you have your contact information up. Um, and certainly, I would, uh, if I don't want to, say this without your permission, Doc, but certainly um, those churches or ministry leaders that desire to know more about how to, you know, disciple uh, your uh, new members and uh, and how to uh, grow your, your uh, Christian education department, I'm sure Doc would be more than willing to share with you and uh, support you in that effort and certainly as a district we're grateful and uh, we definitely want to uh, uh, use you more in the district uh, as you are uh, available and so I'm, I'm truly grateful uh, for this presentation and so I hope that everyone who has participated uh, has been helped uh, and encouraged uh, and gained some resources uh, that will help you uh, shape your discipleship making process. And so uh, I don't have anything, anything else to say, but thank you. And yes, uh, uh, so uh, we're getting a lot of chat. Uh, people are responding in the chat box. And so um, with that, we shall adjourn. Uh, and I think some want to know how to get the presentation, if that's something that you're going to be providing or parts of that. Um, I think we have everybody's email, but you you have to determine that, Doc, is your your information and uh, how you want to uh, uh, distribute that is totally in your hands. Okay, okay. I will, um, they can email me. If you email me and, and request it, I'll send it. And Dr. Leggett, I'll make sure you have a copy. All right, thank you. 
All right. Well, we are we've come to an end. Uh, I see where did she go? Uh, is Erica moderator? Erica, are you on? Uh, people have a tendency to leave. And she, she left already, Doctor Lake. Okay. All right. All right. It's Pastor Steve on. Steve, you still with us? All right. Okay. Well, listen. Let's pray out because I I was told that you know you don't want to uh, you need to put a cap on this thing. Otherwise, it's kind of like uh, having an open Coke bottle and not putting the top on it. And uh, prayer will seal this so that nothing spilled out onto the floor and gets wasted. We want to make sure everything is sealed and kept intact so that when we use it on Sunday and the and the uh, also the weeks and months ahead that we uh, shall uh, know that we have retained everything. So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Curtis and yes, uh, Dion. thank you so much for being our uh, host for today. And so we pray that all of you have a safe and blessed day and um, looking forward to you sharing this information with your pastors so that you can implement that. And please, if you have any more questions, uh, uh, make sure that you reach out to Dr. Curtis. So let's pray. Father, we thank you and we honor you today. We thank you, Lord, for what our ears have heard and our heart was made to believe. And God, as we uh, depart uh, from this, uh, this time of learning, Lord, we go away uh, encouraged and motivated and challenged uh, to be disciple makers. And so, Lord, in this season where so much is difficult, Lord, help us to remember the church commission and uh, remember also, God, that you've said in your word that when we make disciples, that you are present with us to the very end of the age. So we thank you. We thank you for Dr. Curtis. We thank you for our district. We thank you for each and every person who has come to this moment. We pray, God, as we move from this place, but not your sight. God, that we will go encouraged and again motivated uh, to embrace the commission to make disciples. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, since I'm not the host, I can leave. So, yeah, <laughs> I gotta wait for everybody to get off before you hang up. God bless you all. Y'all take bless care. You. Love you all. all right. <laughs>